Hello, this is Hayden Scott, lead instructor, EMS University, San Antonio. Now we're going to go over chapter six, infants and children. As an EMT, you should always be cognizant of the differences between children and adults. Children require simple and direct communication. At first, children may be hesitant to trust you. However, when providing care for infants who are crying, you should ask the parents if the child's cry seems different than normal. The parents are your key. They will be the ones to tell you if anything is different about their child. When you triage your patient, you should start with the assessment from across the room. The second you walk in the door, your eyes should be on the patient, looking for any signs of distress. Are they blue? Are they pale? Do you see any accessory muscle use? Are they lethargic? You can assess all of this from across the room. Then, of course, you're going to assess the airway. Remember your ABCs. Is their airway patent? Is their breathing adequate? Are they using accessory muscles? Are they wheezing? Can you hear a strider? Uh, do you hear anything that sounds like croup? Which we'll go over later in the chapter. For cardiac, you can auscultate, but you need to first put hands on your patient. Check for a pulse. On infants, check the brachial artery. On children, uh, Radial pulse is probably best on a responsive child. Look for any disability. Do they have a learning disability? Do they have a cognitive disability? Do they have a physical disability? Again, parents are the key for this. They're going to be the ones to tell you everything there is to know about this child. Next, you're going to expose the child. You're going to explain to them, you need to be able to see to take a look at them so that you can help them feel better. Then you're going to take vitals. Pediatric vital signs, you're going to assess the level of consciousness. This may fall under the AVPU scale. Uh, more often than not, it's going to be a revised. You're going to check respiratory rate and quality. Again, if it's poor quality, they're not getting enough oxygen into their system. Intervention needs to be taken as quickly as possible. Heart rate, you're going to check for a pulse. Again, on a child, radial pulse is probably best. On an infant, look for your brachial pulse. Your blood pressure ranges. The minimum systolic will be figured out by taking 70 plus two times the age in years. So on a two-year-old, you're going to have 70 plus two times two, which is four. So your minimum systolic blood pressure will be 74. Your maximum systolic will be the blood pressure is equal to 90 plus two times the age in years. Again, same two-year-old, your maximum systolic blood pressure would then be 94. You're going to assess the temperature. Keep in mind, a normal infant's body temperature may range anywhere from 98 to 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Do not be alarmed. This is normal for an infant. A child's normal body temperature will range from 98 to 99 up until about the age of 4, and then they'll start regulating to the around about 98.6 body temperature. For pulse oximetry, if a child or infant will not allow you to place a pulse oximeter sensor on their finger, Try their toe. Uh, usually you can stabilize it on the toe to where they can't kick it off, they can't pull it off, and they're a little more relaxed about this approach. For your child or infant, you're going the average weight of a peds over one year old is equal to two times the age plus eight kilograms. You always want to remember to convert all weights to kilograms on pediatrics. Most of the medication dosages are based on weight in kilograms. So for a one-year-old, or for a two-year-old, we'll have two times two, which is four, 
plus 8 kilograms, which would make a grand total of 12 kilograms, which is the average weight for a 2-year-old, and so on. It may be difficult to obtain a blood pressure on a child. It's understandable. However, you can still check pulses and cap refill. Cap refill is actually a better indicator of patient perfusion in a child and infant than a blood pressure is. This will give you a good indicator on how the child is doing. Cap refill can be used checking the sole of a foot or the palm of a hand. Stick your finger in the middle of it until it blanches and release. If it takes less than two seconds to return to normal color, their perfusion is just fine. However, using a nail bed on an infant or a child is not as reliable. Appearance is everything to pediatrics. If it looks like a sick kid, it's probably a sick kid. Never doubt the way a pediatric looks. Now we're going to go over the respiratory. Pediatrics anatomy differs greatly from adults. For starters, they have large heads and small bodies. They're very disproportionate. Their tongues are oversized and occlude the airway frequently. The cartilage in the trachea is incomplete, so it's the shape of a cone versus nice and round. Their diaphragms are weaker, their accessory muscles are weaker, and because they have a smaller body, they have a smaller oxygen reserve. For children in respiratory distress, allow the child to assume a position of comfort and sit on the lap of a parent. This will calm some of the anxiety that they have and the parent can help reassure them. You will apply oxygen via non-rebreather mask if possible. If not, blow-by is acceptable. Have the parent hold the mask as close to the patient's face as possible. The reason I say have the parent hold it is because this will help relax the child. They won't be as afraid of it if the parent is doing it versus you, a stranger. However, be prepared for positive pressure ventilation support at any time. Make sure you always have your equipment ready in the event the patient crashes. Mucus occludes the airway mucus which occludes the airway is a valid concern in pediatric patients. Remember their airways are much smaller so when you get that thick mucus it will plug the airway very quickly. One thing to remember always remember in a child kids plateau and they compensate really well for a really long time and then out of nowhere they will crash. So always keep an eye on your pediatric patient just because they look like they're improving doesn't mean much. They could take a turn for the worst at any time. 90% of pediatric cardiac arrests are a result of respiratory arrest. Control the airway and the patient will usually do very well. The other 10% are cardiac related and that's usually due to a congenital issue that the parent will address with you when you ask for a history. One of the biggest issues in pediatric patients is croup, otherwise known as whooping cough. This is where the larynx swells, the trachea swells, and the bronchi swell. The child will have a sore throat and a fever that gets worse at night. They'll have a seal-like bark or cough. This is the hallmark sign. This is, without a doubt, this patient has croup. So as soon as you hear that barking sound, you know exactly what your patient has. Cool night air usually helps. Most doctors tell patients, put your kid in the car, turn the AC all the way on, roll the windows down, and drive. It'll usually resolve itself. Epiglottitis is inflammation of the epiglottis. Your patient will present with a history of sore throat, fever, and stridor. The child will present sitting upright, leaning forward with the neck out, and they will be drooling. This is 
a life-threatening emergency. Do not inspect the airway as bronchospasm may completely obstruct the airway. Do not provoke them in any way, shape, or form. The difference between croup and, croup and epiglottitis. Croup affects uh, patients in the age range of three months to three years. It is a gradual onset, usually sits with a low-grade fever. Uh, you will hear strider, and this occurs during the fall and winter months, which is why, again, the cold winter air is very therapeutic for croup patients. Now with epiglottitis, this hits your patients in the age range of three to seven years. It is very acute onset. They will have an extremely high fever. They will be very hoarse sounding. They will have excessive drooling. Epiglottitis can affect your patient all year round. RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus, affects your patients aged 0 to 4 years of age. This usually occurs mostly between December and April. However, uh, RSV is seen as early as September, October, uh, but usually tends to die off about March. The signs and symptoms of a respiratory infection, uh, thick secretions, and excessive wheezing. Suspected child abuse, you should always document your findings. In situations involving suspected child abuse, it is important to ensure that your patient care reports includes factual and objective statements. This is not the place for any subjective statements at all. Only the facts. Contact local authorities as soon as you suspect something. It's always a good rule of thumb to have the local uh, Child Protective Service Agency in your phone. Also, notify the receiving facility as soon as you get there. Keep the best interests of the child in mind always. Even though you become upset, do not become violent or hostile with the family. This will cause them to return hostility and the child will respond to that. So, Keep a level head, keep an objective standpoint, and always put the patient first. Ask yourself, are these injuries consistent with the story that we're receiving? Are there any old injuries bruising in various stages of healing? How does your child act around the parents or the caregiver? Do they shy away? Do they look afraid? These will be the key points that will either lead you to or away from a suspected child abuse case. This concludes the pediatric portion uh, of your refresher class. If you have any questions or comments, please direct them towards the instructor. Thank you.